you've been a fan of this channel for a while, you've probably noticed I've already done this video, however, that old version is incredibly outdated. So today I thought I'd reiterate some of what was said in that old video, while updating and changing a few, and hell, if this video turns out well, I might do a sequel. And hell, let's just be real here, the original video, it was way too obviously inspired by Davis. Anyway, on that note of talking about unpopular opinions, let's talk about something completely objective. New Who is far superior to Classic Who, and I'm not just talking about production. Yeah. If you follow my Instagram, you probably already know of this because I practically rant about it every time I watch Classic Who because of how many glaring flaws some episodes and stories have, which fans just blatantly ignore. Now the most obvious of which is bad pacing. The pacing in Classic Who is absolutely atrocious. I haven't seen one, not a single Classic Who story that doesn't have poor pacing or have scenes that could just be cut because they are irrelevant to the grand scheme of things. One thing Classic does often in stories that needed to be longer to fill the gap they were aired at was to have the Doctor and Co get captured by someone, only to have them then escape just to get captured again. So, what was the point in the last 25 minutes I just wasted on that? And you might be thinking, how does having a slower pace make the episodes worse? And there's nothing wrong with slower paced episodes. There's plenty of great stories in the revival that have a slower pace, but they don't feel dragged out or boring. Classic Who could have a story that would otherwise be something like a solid 8 get dragged down to something like a 6 or 7 because of having parts where fuck all happens and it just brings down the story considerably. Take for example the Silurians and the Sea Devils, both have potential to be super interesting and engaging stories and when they actually get the fuck on with it, they are. The Silurians is a four part story that's stretched to 7, the first three parts could have been done so much quicker. The cliffhanger of the Doctor seeing the alien should be the cliffhanger to part 1, or a stretch 2, not fucking 3. And the sixth part of the story is literally just the Doctor and Liz doing things in the science lab, the Brigadier on the phone, and people dying to this virus. For 25 fucking minutes. Same issue happens in the Sea Devils, not nearly as bad though because the story does actually start well, the first two parts are both excellent but then the third and the fourth just halt that streak of greatness and put it on a complete standstill until part five. Writing stories in a way that wastes time for no other reason than to fill a time slot is bad writing. Even the best stories have a part of wasting time. Curse of Peladon, my current favorite Third Doctor story, the first part is an absolute waste of time and could have been summarized in 10 minutes at the most. I think a lot of the reason these supposedly great episodes end up annoying me so much is the classic Who fans overhyping episodes that don't even come close to matching the quality they're made out to be. The only ones that have even really came close to living up to the hype were the Caves of Androzani and Remembrance of the Daleks. Genesis is close, but it's just dragged out. But even Caves of Androzani has an embarrassingly bad monster in it. And that's another thing about classic. There's at least one embarrassing moment in every story. I don't think I've watched a single one without laughing at something. Whether that be from how tone deaf they are, or just how fucking stupid and terrible something can look. Speaking of stupid and terrible, Classic Who Doctors aren't even comparable to new ones. They all suck! Nah, I'm joking, they don't. But the new Who ones run laps around the Classic Who ones. Except for Whitaker, obviously, but Chibnall's era isn't part of New Who since it can't match anything quality-wise from even the worst of Russell's and Stevens' eras. Not that every character ever needs to have an arc, but you would never get anything as deep and complex as the Tenth Doctor's arc in Classic Who. And that's not really a bad thing, because most of the Classic Who Doctors are just carried by the actors who played them being great actors and characters. But I feel like this lets down certain other Doctors who didn't get to fully embrace the role. Take, for example, The Fifth Doctor. If you've seen the excellent Doctor Who review by Clever Dick Films, you would know that around The Fifth Doctor's era, the character of The Fifth Doctor was basically just down to Peter Davison himself. And he himself has admitted that he had struggles with the characterization of his Doctor, and that's incredibly obvious when you watch his era. 
Despite being known as the generic nice doctor, when I think of the fifth doctor, I just think of that moody, short-tempered twat with the boring companions who he doesn't seem to give a shit about. I think Davis nailed him perfectly when he said that he seems to be actively resisting an arc. There's so many bits and pieces here and there that made it so Five could have had an arc, but he just doesn't. Companions could die, leave or betray him and he just never really cares. In some stories, he seems like a completely different Doctor, and if he stuck to the way he played it in certain stories, he would be much more interesting. Like, Davison plays the Doctor so well in both Frontiers and Caves of Androzani, but those are the only two episodes he stands out to me in. And I've seen almost all of his episodes. If he played the Doctor the way he did in those stories constantly, then he probably wouldn't be my least favourite Doctor in Classic Who, and my least favourite ever. And to clarify, I don't hate the 5th Doctor, he's just annoying to watch because of the amount of obvious potential that just went to waste. It doesn't help that he's sandwiched between Doctors who are so much more interesting than he is. But the others aren't without fault either. Let's start with Baker first, well, Tom Baker. Now Tom Baker is the most iconic Doctor in Classic Who for a reason, and it's not just because he stayed for 7 years. His portrayal of the 4th Doctor and Tom Baker himself is one of the most iconic personalities in anything ever. However, this also makes it incredibly obvious when Tom doesn't give a shit about what he's been given. Hence, Season 18. If Tom Baker left after Season 17, he probably would be better than some of the great New Who Doctors, but unfortunately, having an entire season where you can see that the main star of the show doesn't give a shit brings him down significantly. And this is pretty much all the classic Doctors with how inconsistent they are. Pertwee's Doctor actively contradicts his own character story to story. He can go from, Joe, the Brigadier is your superior and you must respect him too, the Brigadier is an idiot because of how much he relies on bullets. The Sixth Doctor can go from Peak Colin, which is a Sascard asshole with good intentions low down, who genuinely cares for his companion, to a genuine psychopath who chloroforms someone. Seven is quite possibly the most inconsistent Doctor season to season, and definitely one of the most overrated. In season 24, he is absolutely terrible. And when I say terrible, I mean terrible. Worse than Series 7 Smith, worse than Series 10 Capaldi, and worse than all of the Fifth Doctor, and even worse than Jodie at points. He has zero personality outside of being a clown, and he acts like an absolute fucking idiot episode to episode. He is embarrassingly awful in this series. In season 26, he is fucking excellent. He's dark, cunning, brooding, and manipulative, and this is the best McCoy. In season 25, he's a mix of these two, but nothing really special. And one last thing New Who does way better than Classic is Companions. The absolute leagues and miles better that New Who companions are compared to Classic is almost as severe in the, as the difference in Doctors. Let's keep this brief since I've already ranted about Classic way longer than intended. Sarah Jane Smith is commonly considered to be the best companion in the Classic series, and for the life of me I can't see why. She's so whiny and annoying and not remotely interested, and most of the time just devolves into screaming. And me, a person who has never dissolved to screaming, finds this incredibly fucking annoying. But this isn't just Sarah Jane for this case, this is every female companion in Classic Who. Even the best ones are just turned into objects for screaming. This is extremely diminishing to all of their characters and repetitive and annoying as fuck. The only one who doesn't do this is Ace. And coincidentally, she is the most interesting and well-written Classic Who female companion. She's also one of the only ones to have an interesting and well-written arc, making following her from G Dragonfire up until Survival interesting as fuck and actually feels rewarding. She wasn't just there as eye candy for the audience like others. Well, I mean, well, she kind of is. But being fit wasn't her introduction, like certain others. She wasn't constantly screaming, she didn't annoy the shit out of the audience. So damn, there is one good Classic Who female companion. Now the ratio from listenable to embarrassing is 1 to fucking 19. But to clarify, they aren't all bad. And male companions are much better in Classic Who. Mostly. Ian, Barbara, Jamie, Zoe, Liz, Joe, Harry, Romana and Perry, while all having flaws of their own, aren't bad by any means. 
but they aren't even comparable to companions like Rose, Martha, Donna, Amy, Will, Rory, Clara, Donna, Noddle, or even Captain Jack fucking Harkness, holy shit! The New Who ones have so much more depth and so much more impact on the story and other characters, it makes them so much more interesting to watch than generic screamers or boring slates. While Rose isn't written really well in Series 2, her arc of becoming so obsessed with the Doctor that it leads to her eventual downfall, it's at least something. It's better than nothing. Hell, New Who even made Sarah Jane much more interesting in School Reunion alone, which isn't even a very good episode. So, what do we take away from this overly bloated section? New Who is objectively better written than classic. New Who has better writing, characters, stories, pacing, and most importantly... But now I'm going back to bullying it. Stephen Moffat, while capable of being an excellent writer, is a bad showrunner. Oh, that hurt to say, but unfortunately I've got to admit, it's just true, and it's something that I and most likely many other people have been in denial about for a very long time. Because you always see so many people online act as if Moffat is the worst thing to happen to this show, and I've always at least tried to defend him, and I still will. But if you look critically and objectively at how he ran Doctor Who, he isn't a good showrunner, especially compared to Russell. Don't get me wrong, Moffat in his era was still capable of writing excellent stories and delivering satisfying character arcs, but none of them are perfect. And if you know me, I put characters over everything. Great characters can save a shit episode, but bad characters can't. And Moffat fucked up all of his characters or they started terribly. None of them are perfect. Or even comparable to most of Russell's. Why do you think I was so passionately fucking furious at Asylum of the Daleks? To start off with, Amy Pond, as she's probably the most prominent one, and in Series 5, Amy is okay. She wasn't really bad, besides a few scenes in particular, but she rarely really did much to make her stand out to what came before. In Series 6, Amy has fully developed into one of the greatest companions of all time. She is fully likeable in every single episode, is interesting, in every single story, and her character is taken in so many interesting directions, she was definitely done the best in this series. But then we look at Series 7. And first of all, why are the puns even here? They had their perfect bookend in Series 6 there. There was literally no reason to bring them back. And in the case of Amy, completely ruined them. Amy went from the most likeable, interestingly explored character Moffa has ever written in Series 6, to a completely hateable cunt in the first episode of Series 7. She divorced Rory for one of the most retarded reasons possible, they quote-unquote can't have kids, despite the fact you already have one and even if you can't conceive, adoption exists. She assaults him, she's rude, unlikable, and everything that was great about her in Series 6 was absolutely shat on here. What about Clara? Well, for the case of Clara, it's actually the complete opposite order. Clara actually started out fucking abysmal, and when I say fucking abysmal, I really mean it. Holy shit! She is somehow annoying, unlikable, pushy, overbearing, a main plot point for Series 7B, all at the same time, but is still a boring cunt! But then, in Series 8 and 9, she actually becomes a character, and a likeable one at that. But she still can't be compared to the greats of Russell's era, because of how truly insufferable she was in Series 7. The next main character wrote by Moffat was Bill, and Bill is one of the most boring quote-unquote characters ever. Seriously, go to anyone who likes Bill and ask them a name character traits outside of nice, occasionally funny, and being a lesbian, because that's all her character really is. Now, obviously, I don't have a problem with her being a lesbian, because I'm a raging incel and I hate all women anyway, but there's so many scenes in Series 10 where we could get more character for Bill, but it's just replaced with... By the way, did you know I was a lesbian? But to clarify, Bill isn't really a bad companion, but that doesn't make her good either. She's just sort of there. Like, Bill isn't even comparable to the likes of Series 7 Amy or Clara, but she just ends up being really dull. Another staple of the revival in general is that of series arcs, and Russell, for the most part, 
did these really well. How did Steven do them? Well, to keep it brief, every single one of them is a letdown to some extent, and that's a shame. Because some of them had such interesting concepts and could have led into something interesting, but just don't. And on that note, all of Moffat finales are bad, to some extent. Yes, even the ones I really like, I have to admit, have some failures in them. First series arc, a mystery box, what are the cracks in the wall, and what's locked inside the Pandorica. Turns out it was literally every villain ever trying to trap the Doctor in to save the universe. Super interesting conflict, what did they do with this in the second part? Fuck all! The Doctor uses a vortex manipulator and teleports around for a bit before yeeting himself into the explosion for some emotional weight only for it to be undone in a really cheap way. And the Pond's wedding, which has been built up over this entire series, feels pointless because of how willing Amy is to cheat on Rory. Series 6, the origins of River Song built up of the entire series lead to a reveal that doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, only to have a nonsensical finale that marries the Doctor and River only to have her appear three more times. EVER! Series 7 didn't even have an arc until it decided the Great Intelligence killing the Doctor was an arc, despite it having little to no setup, for it then to decide that it needs to set up the 50th. Yeah, pretty pointless. And what do all these series arcs and finales have in common? Terrible resolutions and opening more questions than giving satisfying answers. Capaldi's first two finales are a lot less egregious in what they fail or let down. The only thing wrong with the Series 8 finale is that the Cybermen coming back from the dead concept is pretty much dropped in the second part for a story with the Master. But the Master story itself isn't bad, so it makes up for it. Hellbent sort of weighs the return of Gallifrey by not focusing on it enough and focusing on Clara. But, like I said in my Series 9 ranking, what the Doctor does on Gallifrey is completely in character, and both Twelve and Clara's characters are expertly showed here, and this is the perfect ending Moffat has ever done. Until he did the Husbands of River Song. And then he did Twice Upon a Time. Speaking of Series 10, the hybrid arc and the vault here are probably the worst arcs he's ever done, but to be honest, the hybrid, despite being brought up every episode, is so easy to ignore that it doesn't really bring down the series that much. The Vault is given way too much focus and is a basic and obvious desperate attempt to recreate the Series 5 arc, and it's just revealed midway through the series as if it didn't even fucking matter. Whether you like Moffa or not, he couldn't handle characters very well, he couldn't handle series arcs very well, and he did not know how to create a good finale, except for the two times that he totally did. And if you want detail on how he did a disservice to both his Doctors, check out the Series 7 and the Series 10 ranking because, for fuck's sake, this was meant to be a short video. I've written four fucking pages on the first two points. I swear the first video was like seven minutes. I'll keep it brief with the next three, I promise. Rose is so overhated. Yeah, to be honest, when I first even found out that Rose in Series 2 was hated by most people, I had no idea why. But on my most recent rewatch of Series 2 for the ranking, which was about in May 2020-ish, I started to understand why. But holy shit, so much of it is blown way out of proportion. It makes my Timeless Children review look tame in comparison. SHOW! Rose definitely has her occasional bitchy moments in Series 2 for sure, but the occasional bitchin' doesn't make her one of the worst companions ever. And her and Tennant's chemistry was excellent, and they are always enjoyable to watch, even if the writing for Ten and Rose was way less interesting than Nine and Rose. It's not awful. I think the arc of having a companion and Doctor become so obsessed with each other to the point of it leading to an eventual downfall is brilliant. But I feel like Russell didn't make it explicit that some of these things were obviously intentional. Despite the fact I just slated Moffat for however many minutes, he redid this concept with Twelve and Clara in Series 9 and he did it much better. Despite Rose still being a better companion than Clara because of Series 1, the downfall arc was much better with Clara. Also, Clara's arc does end better because she doesn't really get a happy ending because she dies, and Rose does get to live happily ever after. BUT! What happens to Ten due to the things that happened with Rose are so, so, so much more interesting that I should probably save the rest of this topic for another video. So that's what I'm gonna do. Who should play the next Doctor? This category is pretty simple, and I have my eyes on four actors in particular who I think should play the Doctor. And if you've seen my Instagram, you can probably guess one of them. Now obviously we're gonna go with The Jane 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 Jane
I honestly believe that Philip Glenister would be an excellent actor to play the role of the Doctor, and if you need any more convincing, just watch Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes. Because boy, the way Glenister can single-handedly steal the entire show in every single scene he's in is honestly impressive. Especially when my main reason for going to Life on Mars in the first place was the promise of seeing John Sim. You know an actor is perfect for a role when I can go into a show literally just looking for one thing, not caring about the rest, but come out caring about another thing so much more. I believe that Glenister has the perfect acting range, talent and charisma for the role of the Doctor. Keeping on the topic of this show, I also think that Keely Hawes would be a good choice for the Doctor. I only started thinking this recently when I realised my three choices for the Doctor were all men. And I just thought, if I was to choose a female actor for the role, who would I choose? And the first person who came to mind was Keely Hawes. Mostly because of how excellently she plays the role of Alex Drake in Ashes to Ashes. And to be honest, I don't even think Alex is nearly as good as a character as Sam or Jean, because she's let down in a lot of aspects. Potentially more on that in the future. But she always played the character perfectly, and I think she could really bring something new and interesting to the role of the Doctor. My last choice for an actor to play the Doctor is Simon Pegg. Of course! How could it not be Simon Pegg? Simon Pegg stars in three of the best British comedies of all time, each time playing a very different role. And all three of these roles, with some tweaks, could be moulded into a characterisation of the Doctor. His Doctor could be heroic when required, but mostly has an everyman approach to saving the universe. He could be a lot sterner and strict, more physically and educationally superior, and be a more serious Doctor. Or he could be a fun-loving crazy man who, while clearly past his prime, acts like he has the body of a 20-year-old man. I think that showing Peg's clear range and capability, he would be perfect for the role. Well, besides ME, OF COURSE, HOW CAN WE GO WITHOUT MENTIONING ME? I WOULD BE PERFECT! I could take the Doctor to a whole new level of depth with a whole new persona of more fun-loving Doctor only to take a dark turn to a massive dark story involving Jack, the Johnson Master, for the love of God, HIRE ME! You Who regeneration stories are some of the greatest things this show has to offer as a whole. Yeah, this one's a bit simple, really. Part of the ways, a story which I neglected to mention before for some reason, is the perfect cap-off to the best series of Doctor Who, ending all of its brilliant character arts set up throughout the entire series, setting up Ten's arc perfectly, while delivering some excellent closure to the series in the ninth. The End of Time is the greatest story in the entire show which gives us the greatest exploration of the Doctor and the Master as characters, while giving us the best one-time companion ever and the best showcase of the Time Lords ever. The Doctor is an overrated shit heap, but Eleven is absolutely fantastic. But Twice Upon a Time gives us the second best exploration of depression in all of Doctor Who, and gives us not only a perfect send-off to Twelve, but to Moffat as a showrunner. And Doctor Who in general. And that was my redoing of my very first Doctor Who video from over two years ago now. Fucking hell. Who would have thought me rewatching Doctor Who because I was bored would lead into an entire channel resolving around it? Anyway, tell me some of your unpopular opinions in the comments below. And wish me a Merry Christmas because that's when this thing's been wrote.